what I did today, guys, everybody who's here, um, except for children, um, will be getting a copy of this book signed. So eventually I'm going to take my place over there and start signing. Um, you'll have your red ticket, right? So you'll hold on to your red ticket and give it to me. Um, and, well, I'm going to have somebody there helping me. Now, this is my first book tears that I saw. I have some of these books as well. This is my second one. Beyond the Mango Tree. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Beneath the Golden Mango Tree. This is my first book, Beneath the Golden Mango Tree. The second book is Beyond the Mango Shade. If you buy this book, I'm not saying you can't follow the story, but they're trilogies. They, the, the, it goes it's the same characters, and of course, new ones are introduced. And of course, all of my story has some mysteries and sus suspense. So if you buy just this book and read it, I'm not saying you won't follow what's going on, but it's not the same effect, folks. You have to get the mystery in this book. Then the whole mystery in this book, and then this one, I'm finally, like I, I was telling somebody, I feel like I'm mentally ill because I've had these people in my head for, I was pregnant with this young lady, 30 years. Um, I've had them in my head. And in some ways it became like a family to me. And now all of a sudden, it's done. I don't have this series to um, write anymore. So, the Beneath the Golden Mango Tree, we're gonna have some of these available. Normally it's $25, it's gonna be $20 today. Beyond the Mango Shade is usually $15, it's gonna be $10, so together, you can get both books for $30, and of course this one comes with your ticket price. These two books were nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. The University of Belize and Mercy College used them. One, one of the professors at Mercy College, um, he was very impressed with it and he nominated me for a Nobel Prize. And I tell you, I didn't care whether or not I won, I just, I didn't win, but just the, the thought of him nominating me was enough. Um, both of these books, this one just came out, but these, both of these books are Book of the Month in the Hempstead um, Dispatch, or Long Island Dispatch. Um, and they, these books have gone for a long place, for a place. You know, I've never been out there really going much with the promotion because I'm a mother uh, of a young son. And so right now his education means a lot to me. So I had to kind of scale back some things that I would normally have done in terms of books. And at one point I did a lot of promotion and then eventually I just said, you know what? This little boy is not gonna be nine and 10 and 11 anymore. When he's gone off to college and I'm bored, then I'm gonna do all the promotion I want. And, back, and, and at that point I probably wouldn't want to be bothered. <laughs> but, but right now I just um, you know, try to take it easy. And they basically sell themselves online Anybody who's interested in getting a copy, um, hopefully people are here, you have a chance to get it cheaper. But if you know anybody who wants a copy, they can always go to www.trishsainthill.com. You also will have some little, um, some little mini flyers. Save the date, please save them. Every year to fund the program in St. Vincent for the Garifuna Cultural Retrieval, we, give this flyer. I mean, we do this um, dinner dance here. And so this is a save the date, save it, put in your wallet so that you can come out and support us. The tickets are usually $75. And let me tell you something. Did I treat you guys good today? Yeah. When I do something, I don't want people to walk away that happy. I would rather you say, like people say to me, well, you're not making any money, you're giving them all that food. It's, everything is not about money, you know? I just want people when they come, they can say, man, when she got something, it's well hooked up. When we, we, Rosita, you were here. We had black and white tablecloth, we had crystals, china, silverware, balloons, table pieces. This looked like a fancy hall when we were done with it. Uh, last, last April, April 5th, I think it was this year. It's gonna be April 4th. And please come on and support because this is how I raise funds to be able to fund the program in Trinidad so we could really make a dent in bringing the Rifana, um, language and culture back. So please come out and support me on the, two, uh, the 4th of, of April. Um, okay. Now, I know I gave, I know I gave you guys some tidbits from 
the um, historic part of the book. In this book, I've often said, I was a young immigrant girl. And I wrote a story which, I knew how Tony said, um, that's probably part of your story. I would be lying if I didn't say that some pieces of it are autobiograph autobiographical. Because you would, you know, tip your writing with little pieces of experiences. It's not like my life or something specifically with me, but something I may know about. Um, and I would twist it a sort of way to kind of make it funny or make it, you know, um, interesting. But finding out about my girlfriend her roots um, allowed me to mix that story, as Tony Johnson said earlier. And some tears of exile. We have two periods. It starts off in um, modern day, as this young man is trying to find relatives of his grandfather, a, friend, a very good friend of his grandfather. Because you imagine, right, in St. Vincent, when the exile happened, those of us left behind would have had, like our four parents, um, would have had, a, you know, somebody that we knew that were exiled many people that were exiled. And so there, it was quite a somber moment in St. Vincent. You know, to see the soldiers walking around and telling you, if you to speak one word of that language, I'm gonna blow your head off. Because you know what? The reason that you know black people were able to um, fight us and win because you feed that their, their language that we don't understand. But the Garifunas knew every language the Europeans had. They could speak French when they speak at least St. Vincent fluently. They could speak English and they spoke fluent Garifunas. So they did not want that Garifuna language being spoken. Um, I think the one thing that survived in St. Vincent and is, is the cooking, is our cooking. We really very much, you know, you've been mentioned to here, know about Madame Godamble. Hi, my friend Maureen King, how are you? Maureen, by the way, is, um, I'm just gonna give you a moment, stand up, I'm walking in a book for Maureen. It's called The Day. Yeah, give a, give a round of applause. She is an author. Her book is called The Day My Daddy Died. And it's about a child who lost her father to gun violence. Maureen is an educator and an owner of several daycares here in, in, um, in Brooklyn. And she wanted to make a contribution to children who are going through this kind of trauma. And so walking on the book for her, we're almost finished. We're right at that point, right? But to send it out. So keep your eyes on for The Day My Daddy Died. If you have any children, who are suffering from something like that, it might be a book they might want to read. It's a very, very, very interesting, very touching book. So Maureen, congratulations. I, I walk on for publishing. Let me just run to publish it quickly. I walk on about three, four to five projects a year. I don't do more than that because I don't want to become overwhelmed. Remember, I, am, I have a corporate job. I, I'm, a, I'm in IT management. I have a staff. Um, some of my staff are here. Uh, 20, how many of us? How many of you guys? 26, 26 people, including Tammy? About 26 people. I have a, a publishing company. I run Yuga Cure, the publishing the, um, cultural retrieval organization. And I have a lot of different things I'm doing. And of course, I'm a mom and a grandma. So I am not one that's going to bond myself out. What I do, I pick projects that are very careful. I'm very careful that I pick my projects. I have to, something has to touch me very carefully. I don't advertise. I don't ask, I don't go on the radio or the newspaper and ask people f to um, bring their books to me. But when something comes by my desk that I, I feel touched to work with, you know, my publishing company does not say, let me take your book and throw it in the garbage because you're not um, to um, Tony Morrison. What I look at is, is this an interesting story? Is this educational? Is this something I think could be useful to people? And then I said, okay. I have, for instance, worked for people that don't know how to type. So they had to write something and give it to me. And I have to get my typist to type it. And I have to get people who proofread it. My sister, Utilda, is invaluable to me, proofreading. My sister, my Roxanne, invaluable to me, proofreading. My friend, Caroline Mitchell Davis, you also had the, at the door picking up the money, invaluable. Anything I need, create my website, do whatever, make sure everything is up and running. So I have a very tight group around me that walk remotely. We don't walk in an office someplace. So when I pick projects, I'm very careful. I always tell anybody who I'm writing for, I mean, I'm publishing for, it's gonna take you at least a year for me to publish a book because I don't do things quick. Um, so 
If anybody wants to publish work in the future, I know it's not going to be a quick process, but sometimes that's good because it gives you a chance to pay your money little by little, you know what I mean? What makes us different as a, as a genre publishing? We do not take um, royalties from anyone. We charge a fee, and that fee is usually split up in some pieces, given, and since the book takes a little while to put together, it gives them a chance to, you know, to set that in place. But um, we try to be that, uh, an, alt an alternative publishing um, outfit, not one that just walked the traditional route. We don't own your books, we don't want anything to do with your, your, um, your stuff, uh, your uh, money that you're getting. Uh, when you pay us, if you go on Oprah, and then you win, you win, you, you become an international success, I don't have another nickel more than the two nickels you gave me. That's what makes us different. different. We don't have an agreement or contract, so doesn't have any fine tune, fine prints, what do you call it, fine attorney, my dear attorney here. Uh, I have to live in the same house with my attorney, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> I could pick up brains for free sometimes. But, um, but, but, you know, excuse me? The fees are very reasonable. I don't, I don't, I don't want to kill people. I don't. Oh, oh, but no, she comes free. She's free. <laughs> she's free. <laughs> but she's starting to get slick now. You know, she's getting a big shot at her. You know, I gotta I probably have to start to pay her soon. But you know, the thing is that um, you know, just be careful. Again, I'm just gonna close with this on the publishing things. Just be careful. You're publishing out there. What, what, what you see glittering on the internet is not always true. Understand what you're giving up when you just want to click someplace and see a publishing or you're doing an ebook. For instance, I'm trying to put my ebook up on my website, www.tristainhill.com. And the reason I'm trying to do that is I've been selling it to and they've been ripping me off. You know, every now and then I get a commission check and it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. But you know, as I said, you know what, I'm going to take even further control of my work and I'm going to do it through my website. So look out, that's why I said everybody sign that, that book that's coming around so that I could have, you know, I could do like a, um, a Trish kind of fan club so that I could keep you guys updated with what's going on when I'm having an event and support. Next year, around this time, I want to do a sip and chat. Here is why you guys have to buy these books and read them. Do not read them out of sequence. Book one. Book two. All you gotta know, Beneath the Golden Mango Tree is the first book. Then you would know that this one is the last one, and therefore Beyond the Mango Shade is the third one. And when you get a sip and chat, you basically come and at that point you have read your books. So you come back here, we sip on the champagne, we sip on the rum punch, we punch a cream, we coquito. You know, the, you know, we sip and we chat and you, have to, uh, you get to ask me all the questions. Initially, we were going to sell the coquito and the rum punch. And I, you know, I just want people to come. I just want to have a good time. I don't want it to be about me making money. I just want to have a good time. I said to my brother, just get them the, the liquor. Don't drink too much, but just get them the liquor. Um, so, in book, how many people have read book one? Okay. Oh, you did? Even though I told you not to. Well, actually, book one was good. When I wrote book, book, book no, it was, that wasn't the one. But when I wrote book one, that was pretty tame. And my friend Caroline, who was out front, she said to me, oh my God, that is so boring. Like, you don't have nothing in there. Well, you guys, adults, know what I'm talking about. You don't got nothing in there. I said, you know, always, everybody hear me, I got a big mouth and I, you know, talk tough. But I always kind of wonder, if they pick up a book, am I going to be embarrassed? So, one character, you guys know Gloria, she costs like a sailor. No, that's my girl, I love her. If I don't like you, I love Gloria. I like Felicia. I love me, my, my Miss, Miss Gloria. And I was a little embarrassed to put those explicits in the book. So I would put squigglies, like ampersand and, you know, number sign. And she said, girl, that looks too amateurish. Take it out, just put the word, put the word. And that's how I put the actual language in there. So I do not recommend it for children who are younger than 18. You know, people have bought it and given to their children who are like teen, or 15, 16. I suppose it wouldn't hurt them. I just, as a mother, I would not give it to someone who's not 18 or older. It has been used in colleges I, I, I'm in agreement with that, but I don't know that I would buy it, buy it for someone who's younger than 18, me personally. By the second book, 
I became a little bolder. More of my girlfriend stuff is in there. By then, I've been to Honduras with this man right here. I was stuck in a river. Stand up, Professor. I was stuck in a river in the middle of Honduras. You remember that day? <laughs> okay. We were trying to pass into Guadalupe, going into Guadalupe. And the van started to take water in because the bridge was broken and we had to drive to the river. And we had, we had to go, I never made it there because we had to go, they had to run into the village and tell some men to come pull them out. And once they pulled us out, we just went back down to Trujillo. And I'd also been to, Martha Colon is not here, but she, so I went there with Martha and then I went to Belize, I've been to Belize twice. Sister Ro, I know your mom because I met your mom. Um, and I had a wonderful time. My, my people in, the people in Honduras did not speak much English, but when you said to them, I'm from St. Vincent, they said, ah, St. Vincente, you are me. And the warmth, you didn't have to speak the language, you know that you were welcome. In Belize, they had an all out party for me. The mayor, everybody came out. They had a live girl from a band, and they gave me a reception I will never forget. And this year, many of you know, I suffered a fire at my home, and I was really dumb in the dumps. It was just one thing after another. And I called a friend of mine in Belize, Mrs. Kayatan, and I said, I'm going to come to Belize. I'm going to stay in Hopkins at a guest house. And she said, no, Trish, your room is waiting, and we are waiting for you. She said, tell me what type of a vacation you want. And normally when I do these vacations, I go on the TV, I'm on the radio, you know, I meet with the prime minister. Um, not necessarily in Belize, I'm all prime minister in St. Vincent, and I always meet with him when I'm there. But this one, I said, Mrs. Kai, I don't want any, I don't want to do any promotion. I just want to walk on the beach. And they live near the beach. And she really gave me that vacation. She opened her home to me. In the morning, I got up, I went on the beach, I sat on a little bench, and watched the waves, walked back, go to my room. The maid would prevent, prepare breakfast for me. She gave me, my people really helped me to heal to that difficult time. She and really yeah, made me a good time. That, 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 I think um, James Lovell, he was there at the time, but he was staying at another place, I think, um, down south, PG, Punta Gata. And as I was coming, going down, he was coming up, but he had left word with the mayor and all of, everybody in PG, what I needed to, what they needed to do to make sure I had a good time. And they took me all over PG and made sure I had a good time and, and got to know the place. So I had a good time. So I love my girlfriend and people. I absolutely, absolutely love my girlfriend and people. Um, but when I wrote this book, by then I had made those tricks, except for the last one I just told you, which was just last year. And I had a more intimate knowledge of the girlfriend that's living in exile. And so I captured that, I tried to capture that in this book. And of course, some of that stuff that my friend said was boring, it was in this book. So I think that's the one I told my daughter not to read. <laughs> not to read. Uh, she's grown, but you know. I don't, I don't like my kids reading certain things. And then in book three, like I said, one of the major questions I try to answer is for you folks from the diaspora to have some idea what life was like in St. Vincent before your ancestors were taken from St. Vincent, to kind of have a sense of what went on after you were exiled or during the time, how it came, how the exile came about. And so this book was the most difficult time because it starts in modern time and then it branched back to 1775 and then came back to modern times. And so I've never written anything like that. I had written, at, at this point, written several short stories and two other novels, but I had a time of my life trying to weave those two time periods in place. But my sister, Yumiko, or you tell her, some people call her Tilly. Now that's my girl when I want to write a story. Because you might be asking, how do you come up with a story? How do you get time to write a book? You have to map your story, guys. You have to map and sketch your story, not, not draw. Sketch meaning, remember I asked a question on Facebook? What comes first, the beginning or the end? What do you have to know first? The beginning of the story or the end? Hmm? The end. You have to know how your story ends. Should you know the title? Not important at the beginning, because my titles change on me all the time. Just before sending this one to print, I was about to change the title, but I had already advertised it with my big mouth, so everybody was looking for tears of exile. 
So I would call my sister and I say, come over and spend a weekend. And we have a big white board and we would write all the characters, what, what we want the story to be about, how we expect it to end, write all the characters' names, and by the way, characters do get inserted as you go along, right? So, um, she would help me map them out. She would help me map out those stories. And at the end of the story, I have a notebook, handwritten stuff, and that's what I use to guide me. And I am somebody who I think is just kind of weird in that when I am going through a problem, the fire, divorce, you know, whatever you're going through, some people would drink, some people would start to hang out and do weird things. I mean, I've tried that sort of thing in the past, it doesn't work. So what I did was say, I'm just going to write. And whatever stress I'm feeling, I could walk it out to those characters. So when I put the kids, I pick them up from school, they do homework, they shower, you get them dinner, I put them to bed, I say, I deserve one or two hours before I go to bed to write. This is my therapy. I swear to God, I think this is my therapy. That's why I tell you, with these stories, I feel like almost like a mental illness, and now the, the, the book is, it's a, it's, a, it's a therapy. It's a therapy. I just try to breathe, and write those stories, imagine those characters. I could tell you how Felicia looks. Felicia is my protagonist in book one and two. She's in book three a little bit too, but she's phased out. She's, she's getting like me, she's getting old, <laughs> you know. So, time for the new generation. And I know how she looks, I know how she, her mannerism, she's very prim and proper. We know Gloria is kind of saucy, hot, kind of training. She said the things that I would I want to say it, but I don't have the guts to say it. But through her lips, I can say it. And still have people respect me. But then in book two, she was, by book three, she was more of the matriarch. Now, one of the things I did differently in this book that I didn't do in the other books, you guys know we as Caribbean people, we speak our twang. Colloquial English, Creole, English Patois, whatever you want to call it. We speak a broken English. So if I want to say, I don't know, or I do not know, I'll say, me no know. Right? If I want to say, why are you acting like that? I'll say, go make your act so. If I want to say, girl, come here. Girl, come here. But when we speak like that, a person who is an American may not understand that. A person who is French may not understand that. A person who is British may not understand that. So I wanted to do something in this book which I did differently than the other books. I put a little glossary of words in the very beginning of the book. Not in the very beginning, it's actually after the prologue. It says some characters use a broken form of English known as colloquial English. Therefore, some of the words used in this novel may be hard to comprehend. Below is a list of words in colloquial English and their meaning in standard English. So my advice to you, if you're not used to colloquial English, is to read this part so you get, a, you get an idea. Yo, Y-U-H, it's you are your, mech, make, tech, take, fo, meaning for, and so forth. So go over that so that when you're seeing these words and I wear to you, okay, you'll have some idea uh, what those words mean and you're able to follow the story a little better. And all of my stories have a prologue and an epilogue, no, except for book one. Book one did not have a prologue because it was the first one. Book two had a prologue to try to give you an idea what happened in book three. I mean book one, and book three the same thing. And then an epilogue, because you know how a story ends. And man, you just want to hear a little piece more, just a little piece more. You just want to, okay, they got married, okay, what now? So I give my little epilogue at the, at the end to say you know, how the wedding went off or what happened. happened. And that's just my particular um, style of writing. I, when I did these books, I always have in mind a movie. I always felt it would be a good sequel, a good movie. 
So my sister, again, Utilda, dear Tilly, who I have to be nice to and beg so she could, <laughs> so she might see her back there laughing. She's working on a screenplay. Because I just don't have the time. So she's working on a screenplay. So if one of these days you see beyond, beneath the golden mango tree, beyond the mango shade and tears of exile in the movies, don't be surprised. You heard it here first. I want to take a minute to talk about the fashions you guys saw. Where's Elma? Elma's fashion. Well, this is, um, oh, my name is really Elma, but she had, what is your, um, Elma's fashion design. She did a wonderful job, I think, with these fashions. So guys, if you have, there are, her cards are out on the table out front. You can grab one if you ever want to do a fashion show or you're interested in some of her shawls, because I know I will be coming to your place to get some shawls. I love those shawls. Um, and she, of course, designed my outfits, which I, I really like. It's very basic, very simple, and very, very, very classy. And she did my jewelry as well. And very sexy? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, at my age, when somebody said that word, I'm very thankful. Because <laughs> there are many more years I'm going to get that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and thanks very much. I want to, add, uh, um, I want to, okay, somebody look different back here. Who's Anthony? Anthony Featherston, he's taking a break. Oh, there are two Anthony's. There's Anthony Shepherdton. Anthony Shepherdton, you always help us in Yuga Cure. So we're black, we're back, man, way over by the bar. Yeah, we're glad you're back in the US soil. Anthony Featherston, my son-in-law, Anthony Featherston, how are you? I'm all right. He is always ever so wonderful at, in, in helping us last minute. I call him because I was trying to trish my, my daughter, my other daughter, was supposed to DJ for me and then she had to walk. So I called him two days ago and I said, can you DJ for me? And he said, couldn't you tell me a little sooner? So well, I wish I could, but I really didn't, you know, know things were going to turn out later. So thank you, Anthony, you're always helping me out last minute. Mama Trish love you. And the drummers, the girl from the drummers. I want to thank you guys last minute because that also was agreed upon last minute. So I appreciate it. Okay, don't leave without seeing me, okay? Thank you very, very much. Now, I want to give you guys a little bit of um, entertainment, right? But before I turn it over, where well, I'm going to let him play the drums and then when he'll get tired, he'll play some music. I'm going to make my way over to that table and people could start coming over and get their book signed. But I want to open the floor to ask if anybody have like 15 minutes, 15 minutes of questions regarding the, any of the books. You might have read one book. If you have read it, let me say this. Do not ask questions that will give the story away. It is not fair to the people who haven't read it. Leave it for when we have the sip, we sip, and, sip and chat next year that we could talk because nobody should be there who didn't read the book. So now. If you have questions, you might want to know about the writing of the book or how I come up with it. Whatever. If you have a, we, have, we have 15 minutes. If anybody has any questions. Come on, people. Don't let me down. Nobody have any questions? Listen, if you don't have any questions, I love to talk. You all can tell I'm a talker, right? I love to talk. I don't have a shy bone in my body. My mother will tell you that. Of all her 14 children, I've got the big, biggest mom. Who, who has a question? Oh, yes, gentlemen, have a question over here.
the Cairo spelled it E-N-U-M-S. For the British, when they took control, they spelled it E-N-A-J-M-S. Can you elaborate on that for us? Okay, that village was mentioned a little bit in that case of exile, and it, and it was one of the areas of the, around the Cairo region. First of all, remember this. The, Cairo, the black Cairo of Africa has dominated the tendency. They were the biggest population. Okay? And I think it is it is misstated that people think that they only live in certain places. But there came a time when they predominated the windward side, which is the northeastern side of the island. Um, but in Adams, you will find that in Adams, for instance, one of the schools in the book was in Adams, and children would be chaperoned to school every day and things like that. So you will definitely be, are you from Adams? I didn't even know that that was you. I, I know who you are now. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much. Any other question? I know somebody back there had a question. My voice is loud enough. Huh? My voice is loud enough. Okay. Is it fair to continue to call it natives Caribs? I don't think it is fair. If just people know them as that. Like for instance, when I would report people to vote as black Caribs or yellow Caribs, I would always explain that is what the British call them. The proper name for Caribs is Kalanago. And the proper name of Black Caribs is Europa. So it is what they have been known by a lot. So it's hard for them not to mention it. But I would say that today, the politically correct term for, for, for Caribs, the original indigenous Amerindian looking Caribs, is Kalanaga. That is the appropriate term. And for Europa, it's, it's um, Black Caribs. Excuse me? Should we correct that? Should we not start doing something well, I think by reading books like Tales of Exile, where it does explain that quite a bit, in several parts of the book, where it does say that this is a name the European gave to them, but always referring to Garifuna, always making sure we're constantly saying Garifuna. And little by little, it's going to change. Nobody has, and you are the most quiet audience. Okay, I'm going to have, well, I have 10 more minutes, and if it is, and then I'm going to go. And things so. The Caribs, um, the Caribs were there on the island. How did the blacks come in into St. Vincent? Was it because of slavery that they got married to the Caribs that on the island? Oh, I love this one. I just love this one. I just love this one. Wait, wait, one second. Um, Europeans would always want you to think that everything black came out of Africa by slavery. Africans have been going to the Caribbean and to the Americas, for that matter, as explorers. Way before Caribbean, uh, Columbus. So, it is during some of these voyages that these men, you know, and they're usually, let's be honest, they're usually the ones that are going to be explorers. What happened in St. Vincent is the following. The Arawak were first, were the first people right there, the first indigenous group. Well, there was actually a group there before them, but the Arawak came in and they were dominant in, especially after a while, it was mainly St. Vincent and Dominica. And then the Carib men came up from the Amazon basin as a, you know, a fishing, a fishing trips. And they were, of course, as men, not bring their women. So what they did after a while is systematically kill the Arawak, the Carib men, or Kalanago men, and they captured the women as their wives. So St. Vincent's Kalanago, forget the Carib for a little bit now, then we're gonna go to that. Were really not just Kalanago or Carib, they were Carib slash Arawak, or Kalanago slash Arawak. So when Africans who were explorers came to St. Vincent, they met this bicultural society there. Mother Arawak with this Carib father, or Kalanaga father, okay? The Africans were forced walking alongside the Caribs and they eventually get to become their son-in-laws. And that's how the Garifuna came about. The Garifuna then, after a while, outnumbered the Kalanagos, or Yellow Caribs, as the Europeans call them. Now, the story does not say that. The, uh, the, the story and the books, if you read Nancy Gonzalez's um, book and all these other books, it talks.
talks about a slave ship overturning in 16 something and that Africans swam ashore and they married the Caribs and that's how the Garifunas came about. Um, I don't believe that. It doesn't make any sense that people who are shackled would have gone down a ship, survived, but there's no history of Europeans who were free surviving. No, having said that though, we cannot say that Africans were not welcome into the Garifuna community because Africans who were enslaved by Europeans when they came with their slaves would come up and join the Garifunas into the hills and set up colonies with them. So we're not trying to run from that, but that is not the main thing of how the Garifuna people came about. And remember they were free people. Now I'm going to have my brother, my sister Rosita from Central America, she's from the East, she's going to give you more spin on this. Okay? But that is my answer to you. Okay? Okay. I greet you 
Good afternoon. And I can come in and I say, you know here Andy, how are you? But if you watch what I say, I say, you know here, how are you? If my brother Milton gets up and says the same thing, he's not going to say, you know here, because he will be speaking from the male town. He's going to say, I who would because he's talking from the male town. So, there's a lot right now that the Vincentian wouldn't know unless we sit and explain to them the he and the she in Garifuna. That's why I always recognize Sister Trish St. Hill. And I support her all the way with you, you my care. Why? Every time people believe, that there are people among us who believe that the Garifuna is about to be extinct. Now bear in mind, the Garifuna is not going to be extinct. This has been going on years before me. And all of a sudden, our ancestry, she spoke at Amari earlier. That's the ancestry of the Garifuna people. Tristan came from nowhere. We don't know where she came from, but she was brought to one of our original cultural mass. And from that time, we have a relationship with Trisha St. Hill. So when she came up with this idea to revive the Garifuna culture in Yurume, that was great. Because not only in Yurume was this being revived, it was also being revived in Nicaragua. Because we have Garifuna in Nicaragua, who don't even speak the language. And they're just a full throw from Honduras in between Guatemala. But they don't speak the language. So there was a retrieval that is presently taking place in Nicaragua also. So the Garifuna people, the Kara people, the Arawa people, we are all one. The African people, we are all one. Because African, I'm not too sure of that myth that Nancy Gonzalez is talking about because I think she was only writing her book to make money. But she claimed that the African, there was some African trade ship that went aground in front of St. Vincent. Maybe true, maybe not true. I don't know. But wherever these Africans came from, the Garifuna people took them on, saved their lives, they left, they intermarried. Then we became our mothers. But we are there. So they are a part of us. Eventually, the caring part started to like dwindle. And the Garifuna part took over. Because then, when we were forcibly removed, by the time we get to Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, we were then told we were Garifuna. When I was growing up, my mother told me I'm a Garifuna. She never mentioned to me that I'm Karen. She always say you're a girlfriend. So I know that I'm a girlfriend. So I learn about the characters I go now. So I am a girlfriend. And so I believe um, my friend Marvin and me, we have a girlfriend over there. We also have a girlfriend somewhere over here. We are a girlfriend. So that's how we know. So we can only speak of what we know. The others that put their twist to it, I guess that's what they want the world to know.